Here's a question for you. Would you go into Aldi and spend £35 on a bottle of wine? Now, it could be very, very good wine, but it could also be the same bottle of wine that your local off-licence sells for £50. But your perception is Aldi is a supermarket that sells cheaper, better value for money brands. So would it sit well with you spending £35 on a bottle of wine that said Aldi on it? You see, our perception of a brand name is quite important when it comes to spending money. Now let's apply that same logic to a car, because what we have here is a Hyundai. And Hyundai has always had the sort of reputation as the makers of very reliable, yet very inexpensive, worthy but dull little cars. Except this Hyundai is £55,000. Now let's think about that for a moment. £55,000 would buy you an Audi, it would buy you a BMW, it would buy you a Mercedes-Benz. Would you spend £55,000 on a Hyundai? I mean, what would your friends at the golf club think? After all, would you pour them a glass of wine from that £35 bottle that had Aldi written on it? Because what you could buy instead is this, which is a Genesis. Now, Genesis is a fairly new brand, and it's been designed and created to take on the might and the prestige of BMW, Audi and Mercedes-Benz. You don't even buy them from a conventional showroom, you buy them from a space or online and you get a personal assistance to guide you through the buying process all the way through from specking the car to buying it to delivery and then looking after you afterwards. Whereas obviously with something like a Hyundai, you walk into a Hyundai showroom and you buy it from a normal salesperson. But here's the thing, underneath this car is exactly the same as this car. It sits on the same platform, it has the same battery and it has the same motor. But this is the bottom of the range Genesis, whereas this is the top of the range Hyundai. So what do you buy? Do you buy Aldi's finest Van Rouge? Or do you go and buy a basic bottle of red from your local off-license? Welcome to the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Welcome to the Genesis GV60. And as always, welcome to Aldi EV. I mean, Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we go on to this week's road test review of the Genesis GV60 and the updated Hyundai Ioniq 5, it is of course that time where I ask you to make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel, making sure that you press the little bell button as well, because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give a thumbs up, and obviously there's a comment section down below to let us know your thoughts, let us know what you think about the cars that review and the channel as a whole. Now, as I say, these two cars share the same platform, they share the same battery, they share the same running gear as it were. But key componentry sharing isn't new, especially in the electric vehicle world. I mean, we already know Volkswagen Group with their MEB platform is shared across not just Volkswagen, but also Audi, Skoda, Cupra. It's soon gonna end up on a Porsche, Audi, even Ford are gonna use Volkswagen's MEB platform. And Stellantis Group, well, of course, across their brands, Peugeot, Citroen, Vauxhall, Fiat, they're sharing componentry all the time keeping costs down and making sure that, that the EV architecture stays as up to date as it can be. And of course you can engineer the cars to make them feel slightly different. But as I said right at the start, it's that brand perception that we maybe have, which is what these two guys are trying to sort of like purvey with Genesis especially, being perceived as a much more upmarket brand. But as I say, there's a huge amount of money that you'd need to spend to get into a Hyundai, a brand that we've always perceived before to be at the lower end of the cost spectrum. But I was at an event last year with a major car manufacturer and they had some interesting research on bu people's buying habits these days and this is what they came up with. And I thought this was a really interesting thing. According to them, 56% of global customers now say that sustainability is a key factor when buying a car. And 75% of Generation Z care more about the sustainability message than they do about a brand's image and the perception of that company. And then 86% of them will only buy from a company that has that message. So, given that, does the brand image that we've maybe thought about or perceived Hyundai to have really matter? And then do, if that is the case, do we really need a brand such as Genesis? But before we get on with this week's road test, let's take a snapshot of the two cars and find out what we're dealing with. Well, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 was the brand's first of its new Ioniq models. In other words, the new electric sub-brand, which is a world of difference away from the outgoing, old, actual model called Ioniq. 
It's built on the group's newly developed EV-only architecture, the eGMP platform. It's available in two battery sizes with a choice of two powertrains and three different power outputs. And despite looking like a conventional C-Sect and hatchback, it's actually designed to compete with mid-sized SUVs such as the Skoda Enyaq, the Volkswagen ID4, Audi's Q4 e-tron and of course the Genesis GV60. And prices will start around about £43,000 and now go all the way up to around about £58,000 depending on that specification. Now the GV60 was Genesis' first electric only model and like the Ionic 5 and sister brand Kia EV6, it too is built on the eGMP platform. The GV60 is available in just one battery size but does offer single and dual motor variants with three different trim levels and power outputs. Like the Ionic 5 it competes in the same market sector but maybe leans more towards the premium badges of Mercedes-Benz, Audi and BMW. It has a WLTP range of between 289 and 321 miles depending on specification and it costs between £54,000 and £67,500 depending on that chosen specification. So, two cars which are, to all intent and purposes, pretty much identical when it comes to the mechanical nature. So which one are you better off putting your money in? Are you better off spending that money on the base model GV60? Or, given what we said about people's perception of brands now being slightly different, plumping for a top of the range Ionic 5. Well, the only way we're going to find out is by putting both cars through the microscopic road test that actual car buyers are trusting when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that, of course, is the Auto EV one. Now, I want to start with styling because I want to talk about it for a little bit. Back when I was an impressionable teenager, I would always read car magazines and Car Magazine, the actual publication Car Magazine, was my favourite. And back in its July 1990 edition, Gavin Green, it's then editor and don't mind saying, almost journalistic hero of mine, wrote a really interesting article. It was the cover story of the magazine where it said, basically said that all cars were starting to look the same. And when he delved down into it, what he was finding was designers within the car companies, whilst they wanted to sort of have a little bit more freedom, the bosses of the, the, the companies wanted the sort of like cars to have the same sort of family look about them so they could be instantly recognisable as that brand. The perverse thing about it was they ended up designing cars that looked so alike that it was actually really difficult to tell from one brand to another. Now, if you look back at a Hyundai from July 1990, it pretty much looks like every other generic sort of hatchback that was out there. Things have changed. And obviously this is part of the brand's push to change people's perception of them. And I think it's an absolute winner. Now, Hyundai are actually now saying that whilst they want the Ionics to be part of the same family, they want each of them to have their own identity within that family. And I think that is the best way forward. Look at this car. Since its launch, since we saw it as a concept back in Frankfurt, back in 2019, I think it was, this thing has just blown us away. And the common theme around all the Ionics is pixels. Now, you'll see them on the Ionic 5 all the way around, not just in the lights and certain parts of the bodywork, but you also see them pervade in the Ionic 6, which is a completely different car to this. It's much more kind of swoopy. It's got a kind of streamliner kind of look going on. But again, two different models, two distinct styles, but recognizable as being part of the same family. Let's just have a look round the car and talk a bit more about it. The Ionic 5 just looks sensational as far as I'm concerned. And as I said to you right at the start, it has the sort of look of a C-sector hatchback. When you look at it in photographs, you think it's going to be the size of a Golf or a Focus, but it's not. It's a big, big car. It has a presence about it. I love these pixelated 1980s kind of lights here, this whole kind of grumpy kind of Stormtrooper look going on at the front. You've got the big, big bold Ion Hyundai logo there. Lower down, there's no grille obviously, you've got this black panel here that encompasses all the kind of sensors and cameras at the front and then right down at the bottom of these two flaps which open and close depending obviously on conditions to allow airflow and that cooling into the battery pack. Then you've got some nice kind of very strong sort of like you know, horizontal lines there which you'll see around the rest of the car as well and it really really suits this sort of matte grey paint finish. They'd, it's one of those paint finishes I don't normally like on a car, but actually when you see it on this, it just works because it brings out all those really strong, straight, proper creases. 
Now, as you move around the side of the car, as I say, that's where you see these really strong crease lines. Look at this one that runs right through the doors here, and then this other one that just goes down there and just meets up with this section here and cuts in up to that back wheel arch. Really, really nice. I like that. What I also like is on these wheel arch extensions here, where you've got these kind of slashes almost round it, which gives you an idea of motion, that the car's actually in motion. Now, the car's sitting on 20-inch wheels. This is the Namsang edition, so it's the top of the range one. It's the new, um, updated model with the Namsang edition. 20-inch wheels are standard. But look at the length of that wheelbase. That's a five-metre-long wheelbase. That's huge. That's the same wheelbase as a standard Range Rover Vogue. That's ridiculous. It's a big car. Namsang editions all get these digital door mirrors as well now, um, which we didn't have on the original car when we first road tested it um, a couple of years back. And I'll talk a little bit more about these when we drive it. Anyway, let's carry on with the design of it. Um, yeah, there's those, again, those kind of horizontal lines that you get down that kind of side sill section. And of course you get the contrast colour there, which just starts to pinch the bodywork in a little bit and makes it less kind of visually bulky as such. Recessed door handles, obviously, that fold in and then flip out when you need to obviously open the car. And a really neat integrated charging flap at the back, which is quite a nice little design detail, which I'll now show you. Can you see it? Five little pixels. Ionic 5. Nice. Like those little design touches and they're all around the car. And what you do have at the rear, except one of the most distinctive rear ends that you're going to find on the roads today. I mean, look at this. This is phenomenal. I love this. Looks like the dance floor of a 1980s disco. Not that I ever went to discos back in the 1980s, of course. <laughs> love this. Absolutely love this kind of pixel rear light design. Phenomenal. And again, it's the attention to detail that you really love about this car. And you get the nice big bold Ionic 5 uh, writing across the back. And then down here, these again, these sort of like horizontal slashes where you get more lights and the indicators down at the bottom there. Just a really nice, thoughtful piece of design. Big roof spoiler at the top as well, with again an integrated rear um, uh, stop lamp. However, no rear wiper. Now, I'm not going to keep going on about this, but one of the things that Hyundai said about the updated car was it, they were going to put a new rear, a rear wiper on it. Where is it, Hyundai? Come on, it rains in the UK. Just give us a rear bloody wiper. Anyway, and before anybody starts going about cameras, you do get one, which is tucked in there, right where all the crap from all the roads is going to go. So yes, you do need a rear wiper. Otherwise, a very, very strong, proper piece of design that I think, that has a lot of design theme running through it. And again, like Hyundai are saying, they want it to have its own identity to the Ionic 6, which as I've said before, is a more, much more kind of streamlined looking car, which is a much more straight edge and sharp creases. Good looking car. Now the Genesis couldn't look more differently. It's all organic shapes and curves. But like Hyundai, Genesis styling department is led by Luke Donkervolk, want there to be a commonality that runs through it so you can immediately identify it as a Genesis. So there is styling trade, uh, sort of like trademarks, clues if you like, when you look through the car that you will instantly recognise as a Genesis. And of course the main one of those is this split light design that you get here where you get the sort of like the the four lamps, sorry, five lamps embedded sort of like in each of those. And it gives it a really distinctive face, especially at night. When the car's falling at night, it's a really, really distinctive looking face to the car. The other thing, of course, is the shield grill, which of course is now down here because in EV, we don't need the actual grill. So obviously with the bigger cars like the GV70, the electrified GV70 and electrified G80 that we've driven, we've got those kind of big swathe bits of plastic across the front. The GV60 doesn't have that because remember, you don't get the GV60 in a piston engine um, equivalent. This is it. If you want GV60, it's only going to be electric. So it's not trying to disguise where it would normally be a grill for a petrol or diesel engine car. But that shield grill is still down here. You can see the sort of like the shape of it. And of course you get these lovely bits of body colour in here that just cuts into it. So you save on that kind of big expanse of black plastic. Of course you get the bold Genesis badge there, which has got the shield in the centre, which is what the grill is designed to mimic, and these strong kind of lines that run down the bonnet, but these lovely kind of wheel arch here. What I really like about it, as you'll see on the side profile, is the way that the, the, the wheel arch is sort of like set slightly in of the bodywork, and again, it gives a real distinctive crisp edge to this wheel arch. So yeah, so you get this clamshell bonnet that comes down to the top of this wheel arch. And I see these wheel arch sort of like trims, if you like, they're kind of inset rather than being sort of like wider than the actual bodywork, which is quite interesting because normally you find them, they go outside the bodywork, they're slightly wider. 
different. I like it, it's distinctive. Um, down the bottom is the same, it's got this kind of cutout almost in here and again like the, the ionic it, it kind of pinches the bodywork in just to reduce the kind of visual bulk of the side and again like the ionic you've got the flush door handles now you can option genesis with gv 60s with digital mirrors but i'm not sure it's available on the base model but certainly they also come with digital mirrors but they've plumped instead for doing this kind of slightly revolutionary thing he's putting a piece of reflective glass there so you can see what's behind you really modern really modern way of thinking that like that this car's got an outdoor pack fitted, which means it's got the integrated roof rails. Now, I drove the GV60 last year and I said that it didn't have the roof rails. I didn't realise it was an option, so apologies on that. But that's what that is, it's the outdoor pack, so you get the, the nice gloss black kind of roof rails here. And look at this sort of wrap around sort of like screen. It's that, that kind of visor graphic that Saab were very sort of like pioneering of, you know, where they paint the door. Uh, you know, sort of the, the, the pillars black, so it gives it this kind of floating roof kind of design and this wrap round kind of visor at the front. And then you get this chrome piece that comes here and just does this, makes it look like a lightning bolt to give it the, the idea that you're driving an electric car. So that's what that is, and then it runs just down to the back. 19 inch wheels, um, this is a premium model, so I say it's the basic. Uh, model that you get in the GV60 range and it gets these 19 inch wheels, 19 inch alloys, which look a little small in comparison with the Ionic 5s, but 19 inch alloys is still a big set of wheels and actually you can get them bigger than that, but as we'll see when we're driving it, I'm not so sure 19 inch is such a bad thing if I'm honest with you. But again, a distinctive looking car, like the one, but very different to the Ionic 5 all organic kind of shapes and curves and and sort of like you know sort of like swoops in and sort of like where it comes in and dives out so it's a very very different looking car and then of course we get to the rear which is of course that identifiable split tail light design which mirrors the front now each genesis model has that the split headlights at the front split tail lights at the back but as i say each model looks very very different you won't mistake a gv60 for an electrified gv70 or a g80 saloon of course you get your big bold Genesis lettering across the back. No Genesis badging on the rear. You know, don't have the little kind of winged badge there and just the model badge over there. No rear wiper again. There we go. Integrated rear tailgate spoiler, which does split that rear window. A little bit like the old Honda Civic. I think it was the FN2 Civic um, started that carry on. So it does kind of split that rear window line. But you do get the rear camera mounted in a slightly better place than the Ionic because it's mounted way up here. Um, so it's not down there above the number plate which is just going to get covered in crap from the road. Um, you've got a, quite a low opening boot and of course you've got a recessed handle there and again like the Hyundai you can get the lower lights down at the bottom there. So as I say two very different approaches to two very distinctive looking cars. You've got the sharp edged creases and pixels of the Ionic 5 or the swoopy curves and sort of like twin blade lights of the Genesis GV60. But which one do you prefer? As always, let us know in the comments down below. Now, despite being based on the same platform, because of the styling, the rear boots are different in terms of the size. And it's the Genesis that's the smaller of the two at 432 litres. Whereas the Ionic 5 has 527 litres. However, what I will say is, the Genesis seems to make better use of that volume. Because, as you can see, you can actually get the four auto EV suitcases in and get the blind closed just you see whereas in the Ionic you can for some reason so although the suitcases do fit as I shall now ably demonstrate he says you can see I've got them all back all my family's back off holiday now so I've now got my four suitcases back. But yeah, the first thing is, you got a cable bag to get rid of in the Ionic 5, whereas underflow storage has everything um, in there, in the Genesis. So you've got that suitcase like that, that one like that, and then these two aren't quite See, it, it won't close. So while it fits the four suitcases in, it just doesn't seem the best use of usable space. And as I say, you've still got a cable bag to deal with in the Ionic 5. 
Now, both cars also have split folding rear seats. So if you split fold the 6040 rear seats in the Genesis, it goes up to 1,550 litres. Whereas you do get a little bit more volume inside the Ionic 5. When they're folded, it's 1,587 litres. The other thing is both cars do have a small amount of under uh, front bonnet storage as well. Now, rear accommodation in the Hyundai is excellent. It's a bespoke platform for both cars, so the EGMP platform, you get a complete flat floor, so obviously there's room for three across. Namsang edition car, so you also get electric sliding rear seats, which, if memory serves me correctly, also recline a little bit as well. So that's excellent. So look, you can, you can really get a nice, uh, comfortable position in the back here. The one thing I will say is, my driving position, I tend to have my seat quite low in the front, so if you're taller, your feet aren't quite going underneath the, the front seat, but it's not I, I, it's not a huge amount, because you see you've got such a big space here anyway. Um, the other thing the Namsang Edition gets is the um, rear window blinds, which is quite nice, you know, if you've got little ones, and this big panoramic, how you call it, the Vision Sky package, which is standard, which just floods light into the cabin and I absolutely love that it just makes it feel really light and airy I mean obviously this is car's got this kind of white kind of light grey leather on the seat not sure how practical that is for children but there you are you can have that it also has heated rear seats as well in the back here and you can also move the front passenger seat as well so if you're on that side and you want a little bit more um a little bit more uh it was moving there a second ago a little bit more space you can actually move that forward and as i say you can also adjust the rear seat um uh, thing from there as well quite good uh connectivity yes two usb ports down at the bottom there so you know you get a nice little kind of tray as well there's map pockets in the back if you want to just slide an ipad in there and you get reasonable sized door bins and there is a shape to take a water bottle in there as well and decent sort of like high level face vents for rear occupants as well. So good in the back of the Onyx 5. Flip down armrest with more cup holders and Isofix points. They're not as easy to get to something as let's say the BMW where you have the little plastic covers. You've got to, you've got to jab the kind of prongs in between the backrest and the, the squab of the seat. But the rear seat itself is very comfortable. And as I say, there's a real feeling of space inside this car which I absolutely love. My daughter's been in this car quite a lot this week and she loves it. She loves the kind of seat, uh, the, sort of the big feeling of space back here and of course with that big panoramic roof just letting light into it. It's a really nice place to be and if you've got kids, they wouldn't have any problems at all back here. <coughs> Jumping into the Genesis, immediately you are struck with, it just feels like there's a little bit less space. Now it's the same platform as I say, so again you've got that flat floor, but it just feels that, I don't know, that seat does move back, um, you know, once you kind of get out of the car, so it does move back, but it doesn't feel quite as spacious in the back of the Genesis. Now a lot of that might be attributed to the fact it doesn't have the big glass roof, so it doesn't feel as spacious back here, but you do feel a bit more enclosed, I think anyway, because of this kind of roof line, that more kind of coupe-like profile of the car. Um, on saying that, it's still going to be okay, so at least for three children across the back here, there really wouldn't be a problem. So see, you've got the flat floor, you've got this huge cubby in here, in the centre cubby here, and then USB-C ports on the back um, of the centre console there. There's the rigid kind of airline style map pockets in the back seats, and this I really like. So as well as there is door bins, which will actually take a smaller water bottle, you get cup holders in the rear doors, which will take my water bottle quite easily. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's excellent. Now, there's less equipment on this car as standard, obviously. This car's got a few options on it, which we'll talk about in pricing. So things like sort of like reclining, sort of like electrically reclining rear seats and stuff, it, it doesn't really have. You can move that seat forward. Um, again, like you can in the um, like you can in the the Ionic, so you can move that from the back. But again, I think that's part of what they call the comfort seat pack, which is an option on the 
on the Genesis. <laughs> and this this white leather is, is not standard. It's got the Napa leather pack, so this is not standard at all. Um, so it'd be a cloth interior. And as you see, you're lacking the, the panoramic roof, which again, I think you can have as an option, but it's an option. So I, in terms of rear accommodation, the filling of space, you've got to say that the Ionic does actually win this uh, this part of the test um, for that reason alone. But as I say, still not still not a, a, a horrible place to sit or spend any time in the back of the GV60 whatsoever. So let's jump in the Genesis first and see what we think. Now, we've, as I say, we've road tested both the cars before, so I won't go too in-depth um, on the interiors, but it's worth talking about again. Um, then there's a lot of componentry shared across both cars, which you'll see um, as we go through the interior. The first thing to know about the Genesis is there's a bit of theatre about it, and of course it's got this crystal ball here, which is if you start the car up, it revolves round, and that's your transmission dial. So I really like that, that's really quirky. I press the centre for park, and then you've got reverse, neutral, and drive. The only downside with it is, um, what Genesis also gives you is like a BMW-style iDrive control at the front here. And just if you're in a bit of a hurry, they're very close together. So, you know, you can sometimes just grab one rather than the other. But, I mean, I'm splitting hairs with that. Okay, what have you got? Well, basically you've got the same dashboard interface in both cars. And it's made up of two 12.3-inch displays. In the Genesis, they're all in one. And you'll see when we're in the Ionic 5, they're sort of split into two. But they are, at all intents and purposes, exactly the same. Um, it's very kind of BMW-esque, the way this kind of curves around like we've seen in the new iX1, the i4, and the, the, uh, the big iX. And there's a huge amount up here, so all your bits and pieces on the infotainment system are here. So all your system settings, and as you can see, it is touchscreen, or you can use this controller, which I really like, I must admit. I find that a little bit easier, so again, you're kind of sitting and relaxed, you're kind of driving along, and it's just nice and easy just to use the controller um, to go in, and then you press it for the one that you want. You get standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it's wired um, in both cars. I think we're now getting to the point where I'm, I'm kind of surprised almost with companies technological um, as um, the Hyundai group that they haven't done a wireless one, especially in the Genesis, um, which is becoming quite commonplace now, especially in cars a lot less money than this. Anyway, it's not, so you've got, you've got to connect it via wire. Um, but the screen's nice and easy to see, it's nice and easy to use, it's very slick even if you're using it as a kind of touch screen and you get physical buttons on the centre console if you want to go to home um, or menu um, or a back button as well and then you've got volume for the radio um, or your media here as well and for tuning as well so really slick and easy to use. Um, Two big cup holders, I've left my coffee cup in the other car, unfortunately, but they do fit well in here. And then you've got, at the back here, you've got all your kind of controls. So this car, again, is fitted with a few options, which gives it heated seats and ventilated seats. So they are there. Parking cameras, auto hold and heated steering wheel. Um, you've got a wireless charging pad for your mobile uh, down at the front of the centre armrest, which lifts up. And it's a sort of floating console. There's no storage underneath here underneath the actual console itself but there is an open floor so again if you were putting a bag down there or something there's plenty of space for it and there's a little trough a little tray just at the bottom um, of the actual dashboard itself for throwing keys into it or your phone if you want in there heating and ventilation controls they're worth talking about because whilst it's on a screen they're physical buttons as well um, so you use the screen itself but it gives you the haptic feedback so it's actual physical um, interaction you have with it. So your fan speed, up and down like that. Temperatures, these rocker switches on the side, and then you've got separate buttons for things like full defrost, heated rear screen, and syncing the temperatures up. Underneath there, you've got, again, physical buttons um, to go shortcuts for your screen. So you want to go map, you just press that, and it comes up. Again, the same navigation. Your navigation menu will come up, radio. Um, that will now come up, oh, he says. Turn that off before we get a copyright infringement there. Uh, media and then track search and a favourite button as well. So I really like all of that. It's a really nice, easy thing to use. Um, moving on to the driver's binnacle, and again, it's the same in both cars, and it's the same gripe I've got. Whilst it's slightly configurable, when I've got it in my right driving position, the speed readout and so the, the right-hand side information thing is slightly cut off by the steering wheel. 
and then I've got this kind of useless display of graphic in the center here. I'd like to be able to configure that so that I've just got the, maybe the speed readout in the center. That would be quite nice. You can configure it, but not as, not as much as I would like. However, you do compensate by having a head up display as well. So I do see my speed up there. So all isn't lost. Um, the steering wheel. It's not my favorite, if I'm honest. I don't like this big, thick spokes on it. I like the two spoke design but these feel really thick and just full of buttons. And Genesis have fallen into the trap that Hyundai um, did as well, this kind of silver plastic, and I just don't like it, if I'm honest with you. So it's not the best Genesis steering wheel. I prefer the one on the electrified um, GV70. I think that's the three spokes wheel. That's much nicer. Um, you get brake regen paddles behind you and then column stocks there. These these feel really nice to use, these column stocks. I was going on about it in the big SUV triple test we did. You know, when they've got a nice kind of oily feel to them, like the Volvo and the BMW had, it's the same here. And then at the end, you've got these kind of metal bits as well for, for turning for your um, wiper selection or your lights on that side. Um, drive mode select button is on the steering wheel, which is quite nice. And then over on the, di uh, the driver's door, you've got your mirror adjustment and you've got your um, obviously your four electric window switches as well and the memory position for the seats there's just a lot of silver plastic that's the only thing that's the one thing i will say some of it's quite nice some of this kind of metalized feel here that just kind of cool to the touch along here and you get the nice kind of leather um, on the dashboard at the top there but then you go to pull the door handle and it feels really cheap and that's the bit i think should be metal because it's a touch point you know, that's the only thing Genesis maybe need to just up the game a little bit with some of the things you're actually touching where they feel a bit too plasticky for a brand that is alluding to be premium. That's my only gripe with the interior of the Genesis. Uh, storage is excellent. As I say, you've got good big door bins, cup holders there, big trough there, thing there, and a glove box that's a drawer that slides out. And that's really quite cool. I like that. That's excellent. Uh, driving position is excellent. That's the one thing I will say. It is superb, the driving position. Dead straight ahead. The seats are nice and they adjust well. And you can also adjust the length of the squab on them as well, electronically on this one, because I say it's got the optional seat package. But on the whole, as I say, if they could just up the game a little bit on some of the plastics that you're touching, this does feel like a real premium interior and I love the design of it. And this user interface um, up here is, is really slick and one of the best that you can use. So yeah, it's good interior on the Genesis. Now, you jump into the, um, you jump into the Onyx 5's interior and it feels different. I mean, there's a certain, to say, commonality shared between the two cars, no doubt about it. But let's just start it up. There we go there. <clears throat> so as I say, be put up in a second, your driver binnacle and infotainment screen is exactly the same. The two 12.3 inch displays, but as you can see, it's sort of split into two distinctive screens and they don't feel quite as curved. In fact, I don't think they are at all. They're very straight along in the Ionic 5. Um, the seats are very different. Now this car has a kind of comfort seat package thing where you can lift up the sort of the squab here so you can have your, arm, your your actual things at rest there. So while you're charging, you could kind of recline back. Same with the front passenger. <laughs> See, my daughter's been playing with the seats all week. Um, but, you know, while you're charging up, maybe somewhere you could sit with your laptop. And Oh, one thing I did forget to mention as well that you do get with the um, Ionic 5 is there's a three-pin plug in the back as well, a three-pin plug socket. Um, so if you are charging up a laptop, you can charge it from that. So that's quite good. Uh, right, seats, they're all right, they're all right, they, they do kind of hold you. I think I pref slightly prefer the seats of the Genesis, I'm not 100% sure um, which ones are the best. The only thing is I'm always conscious of that pillow that's at the back of my thigh there, that's the only thing I'm always conscious of. Uh, right, the rest of it, moving on. Well, there's not a lot of huge point talking about this again because it is pretty much uh, the same that you get in the Genesis, except the icons are different. So rather than the kind of um, kind of blocks of pictures you get, you get them as separate icons like you would on your mobile phone. So again, uh, navigation, it's there. You can just go in there and search. So it's a very, very similar type of system that you get on the both cars. Um, the only thing I will say is it's only touchscreen on the Hyundai. You don't get an iDrive controller, so you've got to use the screen. You've got to physically 
um, you know, actually press the buttons to go into what you want as well. Um, and again, you know, there are certain things where you maybe want slightly kind of quicker access to, um, whereas the Genesis has the heated, uh, sorry, you know, the heated seats on a button. In the uh, Ionic, you've got to go into the screen. You've got to go through into the climate um, screen to find the heated seats, whereas on the Genesis, it's just press a button and it's on. Um, so, yeah, so there, there are differences. The same in terms of the driver information. Again, I find when I've got my driving position right, the speedo in the top left and the range in the top right just seem to be cut off by the steering wheel for me. It's just you kind of have to just kind of duck down a little bit when I'm in my driving position to see the information. So, again, I'd quite like it to be a bit more configurable, if it will. There's a different feel to the interior. It feels a bit more spacious inside the Ionic. Again, it's like the back. You've got this big open cockpit. Um, design here and in terms of storage space it's much better in here you've got this big under console um, tray if you like here you've also got a flip up lid for um, that in there there's a wireless charging pad in there there's two USB ports there there's another USB port down there with a 12 volt socket as you can see this is where I left my coffee cup and my flat and my water bottle but this console slides so again, if you want that more kind of divided feel um, with a big armrest, you just slide it all the way forward. If you don't, you can slide it all the way back and flip that up and you've got a much more kind of open kind of cockpit feel. So there's, a, there's, you know, there's pros and cons for both cars in some respects. And this just feels, whilst I say I prefer the kind of buttons of the, the Genesis, this open cockpit feel feels really nice in here. I like it. Um, what else to talk about? Well, some on storage, similar idea. Massive drawer, absolutely massive. There's got handbooks in there. You could fit loads of stuff in there um, to cover that up. And the door bins as well, they're pretty good. Although neither of them are lined in the Genesis or the Hyundai. Neither of the door bins are lined, so things tend to rattle around. And again, you can see this kind of love of silver plastic buttons that you do get along here as well. Now these are the shortcut buttons like you got in the Genesis as well. So you've got a, a physical volume control here and then if you want to go straight to navigation it comes up there or your map and um, that brings that up there. Your media, um, your favourite button, um, tuning the radio and then your, obviously your parking cameras where you can see around the car. So again there's a, a good amount of physical buttons but not as good as the Genesis ones. Uh, your climate control panel um, which is just below here is the same although it doesn't have the haptic feedback you get in the Genesis so when you're pressing you know on and off um, it works the same way you know but you just don't get the feedback through the, the, the buttons that you do in the Genesis. Uh, column stocks work exactly the same so you get your indicators on the left and your wipers on the right drive mode button on the steering wheel you get this two spoke design which again is quite it's nice to hold it doesn't have the big thick spokes of the genesis and it's just the right amount of buttons that are on the steering wheel as well your drive uh, controller obviously is taken away from here and it's now mounted um on the side here so it's a twist um, at the side, it looks like a big sex toy, it's on the side there. You soon get used to it, drive, twisting it forward, reverse all the way back and price park by pushing the end in. Um, you'll have noticed again the digital mirrors. And as I say, I will talk about them when I'm out driving them. They're adjustable through a normal mirror control on your door and you can also fold the mirrors in as well. So you can fold them in, they're power fold as well. So the camera pods fold in. But I'll discuss them when I'm actually driving the car. Other than that, this is a nice interior. It does feel plush. It does feel premium. Um, that you know it, everything's built well. There's a nice use of materials. The only thing that I'm going to criticise it for, as I say, is the same as the Genesis. Those kind of silver plastic buttons. That's it. The rest of it feels really, you know, it feels quality. The use of materials is nice. Even as like the harder plastics on the top of the door, they don't feel that hard. And then on top of the dashboard, again, there's a kind of squidgy kind of plastic. That's your only kind of piece of hard plastic up there. Um, the rest of the stuff, the touch points that you come in contact with, all feel very, very nice. The only thing is, again, like the Genesis, those kind of big plastic door handles, just wish they'd made them out of metal. That would make all the difference. Um, there's a good feeling of light again because obviously this car's got the light interior and you've got that big panoramic roof which again lets a lot of light in. It's a more basic and sort of like simplified layout 
to the interior of the Ionic 5, then you get the Genesis. The Genesis, there's just there's a bit more buttons, a bit more things to do, whereas this is a kind of more pared back, simplistic view. I do like both. I like the space, I like the sort of like the cubby space and everything that you get in, in the Ionic 5 but I do prefer the, the interaction that you get with some of the controls in the Genesis. And as I say, if they just up the game on some of the plastics in the car, it would feel, it, you know, it would feel very, very premium. As it is, two different interiors, I'm probably gonna give the nod to the Genesis to say just for the, 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 the buttons and the kind of the, the iDrive kind of controller for me. But if you prefer this, I wouldn't blame you. Now, both cars use exactly the same battery, which is a 77.4 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. Um, and according to WLTP figures, the ranges are very similar. It's 295 miles on the Ionic 5, but 321 in the Genesis. Smaller wheels, you see, maybe a little bit more aerodynamic, so there's a little bit of a difference. However, if you look on the EV database, the real world range in mild weather, the combined range, lists both at 275 miles. And as we've always found with Hyundai, Kia and Genesis, they're pretty close to getting what their official figures are. So it's a reasonably good assumption you're going to be getting, certainly well into the high 200s, as I say, on a kind of milder day like today. Now, both cars are pretty much, again, the same when it comes to charging speeds. Both will take 230 kilowatts as their maximum charging speed. So from a 350 kilowatt charger, you can go from the benchmark 10 to 80% in just 18 minutes, which is one of the best out there. And I think that's the real key with these cars. If you stumble across a 50 kilowatt one, the same benchmark takes just over an hour. Now, if you're looking at um, home charging, then from your seven kilowatt wall box, you're gonna be looking probably in the region of about like 11 hours or so to charge both cars up from flat to full. And both have the functionality of vehicle to load. However, the adapter is an option on the Genesis, whereas you get it as standard on the Hyundai. Now, as I've said all along, both cars share a huge amount and that includes the motors as well. So, um, they're identical in their power, 228 brake horsepower. Um, the 0 to 60 time of the Ionic is 7.3 seconds. It's a little bit longer for the Genesis, I think it's about 7.8 seconds. But irrespective of that, in terms of what the, the type of car they are, I think that performance is plenty enough. You don't need much more than that, you know, in these kind of family kind of cars. Um, so how do they drive? Well, they drive differently, and this is my point. You know, don't necessarily think that the same car drive, you know, sort of the car with the same kind of motors and batteries and platforms all drive the same, because they don't. There is a difference. Now, the Ionic feels a physically bigger car on the road. That's the first thing that you need to be aware of. It does feel like a physically big car. You see, you notice it when you stand next to it, and you certainly notice it from the inside. There's much more feeling of space, just feels bigger. It's quite an easy car to place, however, because as I say, because the sort of styling is just squared off, um, you do sit relatively high in the car, you know, you've got a good view of the bonnet, I can see the extremities. So yes, yeah, so it's nice and easy. And the rear of the car as well, there's not a lot of vision impaired down, you know, your three-quarter views. That C pillar down the back is absolutely fine when it comes to the um, rearward visibility. Now I want to talk about the visibility in terms of the cameras, in other words, the digital mirrors. Now I don't mind digital mirrors, I've got a bit of a kind of, some are good, some are not so good. The ones that I don't think are very good are the Audis on the e-tron. And the reason being is, the not, not the actual clarity of the, the, um, the images or anything, it's where they position things. And this is slightly the same. So you've got the stalks where the you know the pods where the cameras are mounted, like where the, you'd expect to find a mirror actually being. Um, so your immediately your eye is drawn to that first. That's the first thing. But the Audi's problem is they mount them way down in the middle of the door panel here. So you look at that first and go, oh no, no, I need to look down there. So it's a really weird kind of sort of like sequence you go through because you can see that pod on the end of the stock that's the first thing your eyes are drawn to honda use them on the honda e and their little pods are halfway down the outside of the door and the screen is where you expect to see a mirror so actually that's the best place that's the best system this is sort of between the two 
they use the pods like Audi do, so again, the first thing you see is that mirror, uh, sorry, the, the, the camera where the mirror should be, but the actual screen for the mirror is where you expect to see the mirror, if that makes sense. So it's not massively different, and there's not a huge amount of eye movement needed to go down. So as I say, it's not as good as Honda, but it is better than Audi. So that's where we are with the digital mirrors on the Ionic 5. Okay, that's out of the way. Uh, what else can I tell you about it? Well, the Namsang edition comes with these 20 inch wheels and you do feel the ridges across the road. You do feel surface imperfections. Now I've not driven an Ionic 5 with anything less than 20 inch wheels. So I would be quite interested to see if that is the cause of this. Um, you do feel, oh, that's me going over a white line, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you do feel um, just that those little ridges as you drive down the road. It's that low speed ride that's not quite as well resolved as I think it should be. And I do wonder if it's more down to the wheels than anything else. So, yeah, that's the, that's the fault that I will lay at the door of the Ionic 5. It's not as nice riding as I'd like it to be. It's not uncomfortable. It's not as harsh as the Tesla uh, Model Y, but you do feel it as you're driving down the road. Any little transverse ridges, potholes, things like that, you've got to be aware of that. Okay, the rest of it's all good. The rest of it's all fine. As I say, the actual um, capabilities of the chassis is exactly as you'd expect to find in a car that needs to do the job it needs to do of being a family transport. There's not a massive amount of roll. Um, as you go into a bend, the body control is kept relatively well in check. It's not something you really want to go out and take the scruff of the neck. Um, it doesn't feel sporty, but I'm kind of glad that it doesn't. I'm kind of glad that they're not making it, trying to make it be something that it's not, if that makes sense. You do get different drive modes with the car, and that's more um, from this uh, little uh, button mounted on the steering wheel, which is quite a nice little drive mode button. And you've got your usual suspects of eco, normal, and sport. And obviously, eco dulls everything down, sport sharpens everything up, blah 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 blah. Nothing that you know, nothing um, alien to you there if you've watched any of our other reviews or driven any other electric car. There is, however, a further mode. There is a, there is a fourth mode, um, which is if you press and hold it, it goes into what they call snow. So I'm assuming that limits its torque and just makes the traction a little bit more, um, a little better, you know, in the single motor car if you're on kind of snowier surfaces. So I'm assuming what that's what that is. Um, so you do have that mode. When you're in sport mode and you put your foot down, again, it's like we found with the, the BMW, the Volvo, on our triple test of the other week. There's a nice feathering of the throttle. So in other words, you, you, you know, it's not an immediate bang, it all happens. It's progressive. And I think that's really important, you know, especially if you're coming from a piston engine car. Uh, maybe to an EV for your first time, and you, you, you know that that sharp throttle you get from things like the Tesla, it can be a bit disconcerting. This isn't like that. Even in the sport mode, there is a nice weight behind the pedal where you push it and you go through it, and it's really quite nice. Um, talking of that, then when you move off the accelerator and go onto the brake, you do get a nice again weighty pedal feel. So there's a nice progressive brake pedal, which is good. And um, talking of brakes, um, the Hyundai group, you know, whether it's Hyundai, Kia or Genesis, they have, in my opinion, the best um, adjustment for regen out there. You've got these two paddles behind the steering wheel and you can either ramp it up or completely take it off. It depends how you want. Um, so you've got, if you, you've got level zero where it just coasts. You know, you take your foot off and no regen happens at all. Um, or you can go up a level or two. Actually, you can go up a level three if you like. You can go up another three levels where you've got the more kind of really aggressive style. If you pull and hold the right paddle, it has an automatic function. So in other words, it's using cameras. It knows where it is if you're using the nav and it'll apply um, different levels of brake regen accordingly. And I really like that. I like that level of adjustability. As much as I quite like the little XC40 Volvo and the fact it's either on or it's off, if you do like brake regen, 
this is about the best one and the easiest one to adjust because I say it's just two paddles behind the steering wheel really good like that there's a nice level of refinement to the car as well um, the last time I had the car uh, I don't know if you remember if you haven't watched the video we'll put a link up I took it to see one of our viewers Wayne Goss um, who's another fellow kind of YouTuber albeit not in the automotive sector hi Wayne um, and took the car down to him to see what he thought he's an EV driver and I wanted to see what his thoughts were on the car and he really liked it but that was me going from Surrey to Wales great on the motorway absolutely great on the motorway it's really relaxing it's very nice as I say you've got the, you can sit in a nice driving position your driver environment is very comfortable you know you've got this nice armrest here good padding on the door arms as well so it's nice and easy to get a comfortable driving position you get good visibility around you as I say it's a really easy car to place on the road it's all good the refinement's good as well so you know again it's not as good as say maybe the, the Lexus I'd argue maybe as well Kia slightly slightly quieter um, but it's not much in it in terms of between Hyundai and Kia and, and fairness and that but yeah it's a good car for a long motorway drive so yeah on the whole it's a good solid performance um, from the Ionic 5 um, in terms of that the only other kind of downside sorry I'm just going through a width restriction here the only thing that just irks me a little bit and you heard it before when we first set off on this drive was the beeping of the safety systems now it has a massive load of safety systems as you'd expect lane keep assist forward camera um you know distance guidance cruise control all the rest of it um that you'll want but it is quite intrusive and the other thing is when it's on it's all with defaults on now some people will like that um, I mean obviously maybe that's just kind of my particular beef but for instance you know if you drive down the road and you turn off the lane keeper because it really does you can really it beeps at you and it pulls the wheel so you start wandering towards um, you know the middle the, the middle of the road that white line it really does interrupt you and pull you back and I find it quite intrusive it's not quite as gentle as some are and you see you get this audible warning you've got to turn it off now it's on the steering wheel it's nice and easy to turn off but then my, my, my problem then is once you have turned it off if you stop the car and get back in it so if you stop the car and go and post a letter or something people still post letters right so if you jump out of the car go and post your letter get back and switch it comes back on so you've got to turn it off again I quite like it so that you could decide whether or not you did want the systems on or whether you want them off that would be quite nice other than that I can't really fault it it's you know it, 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 it's a good car to drive it's nice it feels comfortable it, it's it's quiet it's quick enough you know it's a good good car so the GV60 well, as I say, it's the same mechanical setup, you know, in terms of both cars. So the same single motor drivetrain, 228 brake horsepower, not 62, uh, 7.8 seconds. So a little bit slower than the Ionic 5. Not sure why, but it is a little bit slower. Um, but the whole car does have a different feel to it. Now, the first thing that you notice. Uh, is the low speed ride quality it's a bit better in the genesis you don't have that fidgety over the bumps that you get in the onic 5. that's not to say that there isn't uh you know sort of like a noticeable um low speed ride bump thump through the car you do find that but it's not the kind of fidgetiness that you get in the Ionic 5. now this car's on 19 inch wheels but i have driven a gv60 on 20s and again it feels pretty much like a GV60 should so I don't really think it's down to the wheels I think there is a better tuning of the suspension in the GV60 it is the more dynamic of the two um, I wouldn't go as far to say it's as dynamic as something like the EV6 which I think is the, the, the of the trio the more kind of sporty feeling of the three um, but this does have a more kind of dynamic leaning um, than the Ionic 5 certainly it's a very nice car to drive again like the Hyundai it's got a, a nice sort of uh, refinement to it there's a nice sort of uh, there's a quality feel to the way the car drives your driving position 
is good again it's absolutely fine in terms of you know you sit dead ahead you've got a nice steering wheel in front of you and all the rest of it i would say visibility is not as good as the ionic 5 you don't get that there's that styling at the back which is a bit more kind of coupe like than the, the hyundai is so you do tend to find that your over the shoulder view is a tiny bit um interrupted um by that rear c pillar the other thing that's different is your rear visibility because i say bear in mind you get that spoiler that kind of goes splits through the rear screen now i'm driving them both on exactly the same piece of road you'll hear a little bit of a rattle apologies that's my camera cable rattling against the cage um sorry the microphone cable rattling against the cage it's on um, as you go over these transverse uh, ridges along this road but that's the difference what i was saying earlier that's you the the, the genesis deals with them better um, than the ionic 5 in my opinion slightly better refined in terms of wind noise there's not much in it it's slightly better if more refined i would suggest in wind noise um the steering has a nice feel to it there's a nice kind of um weight behind the wheel there's a tiny bit of vagueness around about the dead ahead but once you move away from that off center um there's a bit more bite with it ah now those are those safety systems because again you get the same ones on the genesis that you do on the ionic 5 and again you've got to sort of like press the button and take them off which as i say is not really a hardship and as if you prefer having them on then obviously you can just leave them on but it's just a shame you've got to keep turning them off um every single time uh the brake setup is the same so the same with the paddles behind the steering wheel the two paddles and you can vary the level of regeneration that you get with it so it's either off you go level one two three uh max which is what genesis called the i pedal um where you've got that nice kind of one pedal drive with it so it's very good and again the brake pedal itself you've got a nice uh consistency to the weight behind it so you've got a nice uh there's a nice heavy sort of like accelerator pedal and again you get that nice kind of weight behind the brake pedal too same with the drive modes so exactly the same here on the drive modes really really sorry about that rattle apologies um so again you've got the eco comfort sport and then snow where there is a difference with the genesis because of the seat option on this one when you press the sport mode you get the bolsters close in on you um, which kind of hugs you a little bit more so that's quite a nice thing you don't get that in the ionic 5. i would say that the seat is better than the genesis as well now having driven both um consistently consistently back to back i would say i prefer the seats in the genesis there's just a little bit more there's a little bit more kind of figure hugging i appreciate these are optional um because they have the option pack fitted to it but i do think they've just got that little bit more sporty feel to them and just kind of hold you that little bit better and the head restraints just that little and a slightly nicer position as well it's just it's just right nestling into the back here the back of your head there so yeah i would say the genesis is better in that sense um the wheel well the wheel's okay as i said to you i don't particularly like the design of it uh the thickness of the rims all right you know it's quite a nice kind of wheel to kind of hold away from the kind of quarter to nine um side of it when you're at that position you've got these big fat spokes to kind of deal with um which isn't ideal but it's okay on the whole however it's a great car to drive this genesis it really is uh, yes there are similarities yes there are uh you could argue that is there enough similar sorry is there enough of a difference for you to warrant the extra money i personally th think there is i think there is a decent driving machine behind this genesis and i really like the little gv60 i think it's one of the best products if i'm honest um one safety system that's on both cars that i do like is the blind spot camera so when you activate your indicators as is the case with all the kind of hyundai kia and uh, genesis models you get the little display in the dashboard that sends you the image of what's down the side which is great if you're maybe doing a lot of work around about town or in the city you know you get, you get cyclists coming past on both sides or you know like mopeds or whatever you get a really good um you know that blind spot monitor is a really clever um little thing and i noticed that genesis are now doing sorry tesla now doing it as well 
um, where you get that kind of image that comes up on the, the dashboard of the Model 3 and the Model Y. Simple, camera's there, use it, really effective, I like it. So yeah, on the whole, there are differences. They're not night and day differences, but enough of a difference to make you feel that you could be justified in spending the extra going towards the Genesis. It is that slightly kind of more dynamic feeling car. And as I say, of the two, yeah, I think it's I think it's probably the one that I would choose in terms of a driver's car. And now we get to the point of this whole test. As I said right at the start, what would you rather have? A top of the range Ionic 5 or a basic Genesis GV60? Well, it's hardly Spartan as standard, the Genesis, but you do need to tick a few options when it comes to matching the specification that you get as standard on the new Ionic 5. Now, as I say, this is the new Namsang editions, which is it's the top of the range car, it's a top spec car that it comes with. So again, forgive the iPad, because there's a lot to discuss when it comes to these prices. So, it comes in on the road at £54,150. The only option that is on this car is the matte paint finish, because that's the only option that you can have on the Namsang edition. And that be, it, it comes in at £685, so in my book, if my maths is right, that's £54,835. Now, the GV60, this is the premium uh, trim level. So in other words, the basic trim level GV60, which, as I say, is actually a bit of a misnomer because you think premium, you think it's going to be a premium kind of spec, but it's the basic car. But see, it's not exactly basic inside, but to get it to the spec of this car, hmm. So the price actually starts at £53,905 for the GV60 in the premium spec. However, what we've not got in this car is the innovation pack, the comfort seat pack, the Napa leather seat pack, the outdoor pack, the Bang & Olufsen sound system, vehicle to load, electrochromatic outside rear view mirrors as well, and all of which brings the price of this car to £61,715. So there is quite a difference, in fairness. There's still a difference there. So as I say, to get the spec of this to the spec of that, you are paying quite a bit more. But you see, then it's not quite so clear cut. Both cars come with a five year unlimited mileage warranty, which is standard on them. However, the Genesis comes with what we call the Genesis Care Package. And not only does that include the five year warranty, but also five year servicing. And as I said at the start, you're assigned a personal assistance with Genesis. So booking your car in for a service, you don't take it to a conventional dealership like you do with the Hyundai. What you do is you phone them up and a man comes and drops you off a Genesis car and takes uh, leak to use while your car's been taken away for a service. And of course it brings you back. And that servicing's free for the first five years. Now you can get a service package on the Ionic 5, but it's three years and you do have to pay extra for it. So... I'm not saying it swings and roundabouts because I say that is a more expensive car but if you were to delve back on some of the options of that one and keep it the same price as that you've got to take that into consideration in terms of your overall care package as well your running costs when it comes to both cars another auto EV video another road test review on mid-size luxurious compact SUV crossovers at around about £50,000. It just seems that that's all we seem to be reviewing at the moment. So it does show you where the marketplace is, doesn't it, really? And if you think about the competition that's out there for these cars, they do span quite a breadth. So if you think about it, you've also got the third cog in the wheel of these two, which is the Kia EV6. That's there. And as I mentioned earlier, Volkswagen Group, so ID4, ID5. Skoda Enyaq, Skoda Enyaq Coupe, uh, Audi Q4 e-tron, Q4 e-tron Sportback. And as I say, remember, we're also about to be joined as well by the Porsche Macan, which is going to be spun off that platform, which carries a premium badge. Ford, as I said, they're also going to use Volkswagen's NMEB, MEB platform on their new Explorer, which is probably more at the sort of the, the bottom end of these cars. I think it's more kind of Kia e Nero size. I've seen the car, it's quite... It's more that kind of style of car. But of course, you've also got the Ford Mustang Mach-E at this price level as well. Volvo, well, we had the big triple test last um, the other week, which you saw with the Volvo XC40 Recharge, the BMW iX1, and of course, Tesla Model Y. Can't be ignored, can it? So there's a huge amount out there. 
and more, plenty more are coming into the market space as well. Recently we've just had the Toyota BZ4X and of course Subaru Solterra as well and Lexus are going to have their own version of that car plus an updated version of the UX300E. And then of course there's Mercedes-Benz with its EQA and EQB cars as well which are kind of around about the price of these two cars. So as I said there's plenty of choice for you out there. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Hyundai Ioniq 5. We like its refinement, its standard equipment, good range and efficiency and charging speeds, and of course that electrical architecture. And we love its styling and interior design. We don't like, well despite being the bigger boot, it still feels a bit shallow and not quite as practical as the Genesis. The low speed ride feels quite fidgety on the big 20 inch wheels. The safety systems, whilst great to have, do intervene a little bit too much. And there's still some questionable plastics used in certain parts of the interior. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Genesis GV60 Premium. We like its styling. Like the Ionic 5, we like its range, efficiency and charging speeds. And obviously its 800 volt architecture. We like its dynamics and we also like the interior styling and execution. We don't like, well the low speed ride is still a little firm and whilst we do like the interior some of the plastics used in certain parts do feel a little bit below par especially for a brand alluding to be premium and the price can creep up by the time you've added up the options to bring it to the same specification as the Hyundai. Maybe this hasn't been a conventional twin test like we normally do. And as I said right at the start, there's a lot of component sharing within the industry. Uh, Stellantis Group, Volkswagen Group managed to do it very, very well. And with each of those cars, they have their own distinct characters. But perhaps with these two, there's less of that disparity. They're probably a little bit closer uh, in feel, in design, in essence, um, than maybe some of the other cars that we've discussed throughout this road test. I could have made this even more difficult and brought along a Kia EV6, which if I'm being truthful with you, is the car that of the three that I would personally choose. But I purposefully didn't bring one of those for that very, very reason. Genesis, it does sort of question maybe why Genesis are around because they say when you've got a Hyundai where it offers the amount of luxury and the space and the technology that the Ionic 5 does at a price point where you've got to really add on a lot of options onto this car to bring it up to the same level, you've maybe questioned why that the Genesis does exist, but don't because there is a point to this car and I really do like the GV60. The brand itself, I like the way they do things, I like the design, I like the way they're selling cars, I like the way that they offer that sort of that overall care package with it. And that's maybe part of that premium sense. Whereas you don't get that with the Onyx 5, you've obviously got to go into a dealership and deal with dealership staff like you normally have to do with any other conventional car. So from the point of view of making you feel a little bit more unique and a little bit more special of the two cars, maybe it's the Genesis that gets the nod. However, the fact that the Ionic 5 is as close as it is to that in terms of its feeling of design, technology and, and, and specialness and luxury, of course, because it's not, you know, it's quite a luxurious feeling car, especially in this Namsang edition. And it's the Ionic 5 that's been challenged with sort of like changing people's perception of the Hyundai brand. Maybe that really makes this car the true victor here. Either way, it's a little bit like going into Aldi and discovering that they sell your absolute favourite Chateau Neuf de Pape. Which means there's no shame in shopping in Aldi now, is there? Thank you for watching yet another episode of Auto EV. As always, please remember to make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Once you've done that, press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll receive notification of when our next video goes live. If you've enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you tick that like box. And as always, please let us know your comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on both the cars that we've tested. Do you prefer one to the other? Do you think the Genesis is the better car? Or do you think the Hyundai would be the one that you would go for? Do you have one of these cars? As always, please do let us know. 
Now remember, we're across all social media as well, so we would like you to give us a follow there as well. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and even TikTok now. And if you're desperate to hear me talk about electric cars even more, goodness knows why, then stick on the YouTube channel because there's just an absolute plethora of videos that are on there now. Not just road test reviews and twin tests, but used car reviews, van reviews, motorbike reviews, and our electric icon series. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching and supporting the channel, and I'll see you again soon.